Welcome, day five, Breakfast with Bob from Kona and Huggles on the Rocks. My name is Bob Babb, we're at the Master Spas as fuels go longer. Hoka Let's Fly, Deborah Wetsuits, Form Smart Swim Goggles, Zoot Sports, the original triathlon brand, Quintana Roo, Premium Post Sports, and of course our Challenge Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, three-time Ironman world champion, give it up for Marinda Carfrey. <laughs> racing for two, I like it. Eh, don't know about the racing part. <laughs> So you'll be doing commentating on race day? Yeah. Have you been liking that? I've been loving it, yeah. I, um, so last year I asked if I could do it uh, because obviously the women's race was Thursday and the men's was Saturday. I wasn't racing and Tim didn't need me on Thursday. And I thought, I really want to be able to see the women's race. Maybe right. they'll let me get out there and boat. And how would I do that? Okay, let's see if I can do the commentary. And so I asked and they had me do a couple of like test events um, through the year. and. I got the opportunity to go out there and I absolutely loved it and never invited me back. So I must have done okay. So being on the other side of this, seeing the media side of this, is it a little eye-opening for you? Um, I think not Any really. Any surprising? Not really, right? No, not really. I mean, I think most of the stuff's sort of to be expected. Um, it's much easier on the other side of the fence than being the athlete. <laughs> uh, much more enjoyable and uh, I don't know, I still get sort of butterflies for the athletes and the excitement builds but yeah I mean it's it's just a lot of fun I really love it so I think what a lot of people don't realize is you started your career in basketball oh yeah because you're so tall yes and you you, you could dominate you could stuff but mm -hmm. you, seriously basketball was your sport yeah yeah I played for about 11 years before I found triathlon and actually didn't know why people ran when I was a basketball player I'm like you're not chasing a ball like how is this fun uh, but then I found I met a couple of triathletes. I'm like, wait, you swim, bike, and run? I mean, I couldn't swim or didn't all, have yeah. a bike. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Something sort of intrigued me and then perked my interest. And then one day they're like, you should do a race. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll get a bike then. Well, and the funny part is you were 11 years at basketball, and it's not like you were going to world championships, going to nope. doing the major events. But your first triathlon, you qualify to go somewhere. Exactly, yeah. I mean, well, my first triathlon, I got third overall, and it was a local sprint race, so not a big deal. But still, I'm like, oh, that was actually way better than I thought. Honestly, during the race, I'm like, this is awful. Like, the swim, you're getting beat up. The bike just does not feel good. It's just painful the whole way. And then running off the bike, even worse. Um, but I got third, and something weird happens when you cross the finish line. We're like, I can do better than that. <laughs> And so um, not long later, that was the end of 99, so obviously our summer um, season in Australia. By 2001, I was on the Australian junior team and representing my country, going to go <laughs> to Canada, race for Australia in the junior team. And yeah, I'd, obviously, I I'd got on state teams and I was playing sort of the highest level. Not playing, I was sitting on the bench. Watching, the team yeah. For the highest level in uh, Queensland, where we were from at the time. But yeah, I was quite literally overlooked a lot. And I just think this was my calling. And it, it's funny, there's a difference between team and individual. You can't control what the coach is doing or anything else. When you do this, you control everything. And that's what drew me to it. I think, you know, there was politics and, you know, team selection and um, you're basically out of your hand. But here in triathlon, the person who works the hardest generally gets the results. Exactly. And, you know, no one can, you know, say anything you you go out there you you do the work and you win the race it's up to you so when you won 70.3 worlds to qualify for mm -hmm. here did you do a full before you came here this absolutely was absolutely not yeah, yeah so that's what i think is so funny everybody's like oh my god taylor nips you didn't do one no what uh, was I, your longest ride and run before that thing i mean maybe 20 miles i yeah. might run around 20 miles um I don't know, probably, my longest bike was probably 150, 160K, um, but probably close to 180. Yeah. Um, but running is different to biking. I think you can, you can overbike and, and that's okay. But yeah, we never did a full marathon before no. doing it here. And did you, right from the beginning of your triathlon career, uh, in terms of longer distance, was that Siri Lindley? Yes, exactly. So I started working with Siri in the end of 05 or early 06. And we had a plan. And at that time, I was still sort of dabbling in ITU, but I, my eyes were on Kona. <laughs> and I wanted to race well here. It was just that at that time, the best in the world were in their 30s. And I was yes. still early 20s. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. 
half-hearted. I want to do this right. I want to be ready. And when I get to that island, I want to race. I don't want to survive. And so I waited till like 07, I won. And I didn't find out that I'd qualified for Kona until the end of 08, like pretty soon before Kona. And I'm like, can I postpone it? Cause yeah, it's a little too late yeah, to be ready. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to properly prepare. So they, they said, yeah, you can race in 09. So I, I mean, I was already sort of not mentally preparing, but not physically preparing for an Ironman. So, yeah, we basically spent the whole of 09 getting ready for this way. When did you realize that your, that your run was a weapon, that this is, this is my calling card and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to use this to win? I always, I don't know, I, I always wanted to run 248 um, yeah. from that first Right away, day. you knew that. And, yeah. I knew, and I sort of looked at the times there. People, Women were running, like, maybe just under three hours, and that was sort of the standard. And I'm like... No way, I, I can run a lot faster than that off the bike. But you can say that and think that, but you don't know until no. you get to the island and um, actually run out there on the lava fields. And I did get under three hours on that first uh, day and I got a course record, um, but yeah, not even close to 248. Well, in that first time out, you get second mm -hmm. to Chrissy Wellington, who yep. was winning her third in a row yep. and was unbeatable. But every year, I think the first year she won by seven minutes, the following year 15, and everybody's like, okay, she's over there, we're racing for the podium. <laughs> totally, yeah, and that drove me crazy because Chrissy came into this sport, sort of waltzed in and won that world, that world title. Chrissy wanted to do ITU. Her coach said, no, you're not an ITU athlete. Go and do an Ironman. She went and did Korea or something, qualified for this. Like, okay, got to Kona. Like, really didn't want this race. No. And I'm like preparing this is the race I want to win I want to win it multiple times and I had a plan and then Chrissy comes in a couple of years before and is like oh, I'm just amazing at Ironman yeah. uh, so it drove me nuts um, yeah because <laughs> here she's got like logos glued on no sunglasses no visor just, no, just kissing babies totally. running along like it's no big deal just a supreme talent that woman was incredible and she, she and she pushed our, for, our sport forward and certainly no question I had the results I had because she set the bar even higher so I sort of was like, okay, here's the bar. I can do that. I think I can go and win. I think I can win a bunch of times. And then Chrissy came along and was like, actually, now the bar's here. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a little harder, a uh, lot harder uh, to race against Chrissy, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, she was sort of the, well, not the start, because it's been like yeah, it's women been that have been, yeah, there's, there's always, always someone. Is Taylor going to be the new standard? Yes. Who knows? So when you get second to Chrissy that year, and then the following year, Chrissy's coming back, and okay, see if I can get closer, see if I can potentially beat her. Race morning, there's Chrissy's bike, there's no Chrissy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was crazy that year. Um, I'd prepared mentally all year to race Chrissy, and how I was going to race her, uh, what I needed to do, and it was basically, everything was kind of based off of, Chrissy and then I get to the race day and I had no idea that she was sick I think she kept it very well under wraps and her bike's right next to mine because she'd won and I got second and I'm like getting ready her bike's still sitting there and no Chrissy getting ready whatever I'm like oh she's gonna she's late this morning anyway I'm going <laughs> I went and met with my coach and then over the loudspeaker I hear uh, Chrissy Willing hasn't has withdrawn from the race and my my husband, Tim, uh, was there, that was my boyfriend at the time, and Siri had gone to the toilet, I think. <laughs> and so t Tim was there and my manager, Shannon, and Wendy Ingram, um, they were both sitting there and my face apparently just went white. Like, okay. What do I do now? Wait, wait what? <laughs> uh, I look over at Julie and she's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> um, sorry for my language. No, no. <laughs> um, but it was just, I don't know, I was just like, wait what and I remember Wendy being like I need to go get Siri now and Siri came down and she looked at me and the fiery Siri that she is and she said you race your race nothing changes and yeah and I'm like okay it's now all of a sudden all the pressure's on me right. and I hadn't prepared to be the target I mean I was the sort of challenger and so, yeah, that year was crazy. I swam the best I've ever swum. So pressure is a good thing for me. Yeah. Um, I swam with the front pack. And honestly, that race was kind of perfect. I had amazing swim, great bike, ran a little quicker than I'd run the year before and took the title. You win the title. And it's one of those things. Going into 2011, it was our defending champion, Marinda Carfrey, against the three-time champion, Chrissy Wellington. That was the storyline. Yep. Right? It was these two amazing women who were going head to head. 
And Chrissy crashes like 10 days before, breaks ribs, she's got a road rash, all this other stuff. And after you won in 2010, and we've chatted about this a few different times, yeah. you had a lot of great sponsors. Mm -hmm. You want to take care of those guys. Yeah. So after the 2010 race, anything people wanted you to do, you're going to do. Yeah, I celebrated. Um, <laughs> it was, well, you should. And I, I, it was just kind of like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen to me again. I'm going to take every opportunity that comes my way. And it was a, probably a little too much. And I went into 11. I mean, I still was in really good shape, but I know I could have done better. I could have planned my year better. I could have said no more. I could have been more um, just targeted in my training and meticulous. And uh, yeah, I got to that race. Obviously, Chrissy crashed, crashed um, like 10 days out or something from the race, and she was pretty badly injured. Uh, she still raced, uh, and yeah, I mean, that one is also one like, oh, she only ended up beating me by a couple of minutes. Two, 249. Yeah, so she had a terrible swim because, like, I think one she... One on one. She couldn't yeah. use her shoulder much, yeah. Yeah, so she was sort of swimming with one arm. Um, so I got out of the water before her, which she'd normally um, be a little ahead of me. And... Yeah, I mean, she got a little ahead of me on the bike, and then basically it almost stayed the same the whole marathon. You guys yeah. both ran. I think you ran. Uh, Chrissy ran 252, uh, 252.41. You ran 252.09. So you, you couldn't get her. So, so she broke my yeah. record, run course record, and then I broke her. I broke, uh, yeah, that record and went a little bit quicker. So it was kind of, yeah, just a crazy day. Um, but, yeah, it was close racing. But I'm sure in your mind, it's like, okay, next year, no, it'll, be, uh, it'll be another matchup, me and Chrissy. And yeah. then she up and retires. Yeah, <laughs> which was also crazy. Um, that year, you know, okay, I'm like, okay, next year, I'm going to focus. I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to be here. And I'm going to be ready. And I'm going to be ready to battle. And then Chrissy's like, I'm going on sabbatical for, sabbatical for a year. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, well, then I guess I'm still going to do everything right and try to get um, another title. And was it hard to get motivated, though, not having... Because Chrissy had been, from when you first got into it, she was the benchmark. You wanted, you wanted, I wanted to, to beat her, her head to head, right? <laughs> yeah, I and definitely wanted to have that opportunity to race her and, yeah. and to, yeah, for sure, beat her fair and square. I mean, obviously, she only beat me by a couple of minutes, but she was injured. I would like have liked the opportunity for both of us to be healthy and, and see what happens. But um, it wasn't to be. Um, and actually, in 2012, I had a terrible race. Yes. <laughs> um, Third. I ended up third. Had my worst marathon. I uh, basically lost a nutrition bottle out of the back of my bike um, going over the train tracks just out of town and didn't have a solid plan to replace those calories because that was two hours worth of calories oh. for me. And so I was trying to replace it with whatever I could get on the course and figure out how to do that. But I think I was so focused on getting the calories in that I didn't drink enough water. So I was severely dehydrated <laughs> by the time I got to the run. By the halfway point on the run, I'd caught Leander Cave and I was in second, well, I ran up to a shoulder and then the wheels came off. Double cramps in the calves and it was the hardest last 10 or so miles of my life just like trying to get back to town. Uh, Leander ended up winning. Yes. Um, so I was in position like at that point if I could run my usual run to win, but I didn't um, look after myself well enough right. and paid the price. And Siri was coaching Leander. And that's right. And <laughs> Siri was coaching Leander at that time. I'd left Siri at the end of 2011. I just really wanted to focus on my bike and go to a coach that was bike specific and went and did that and felt that my bike was getting better. And I think it showed in the race. But again, nutrition is such a big, important component. And, and I didn't do the, you know, I didn't look after myself. So pay the price. So, the, but the following year you get, you get your title. Yes. And then the following year is one of the classic races of all time, right? This young woman named Daniela Reef, who was sitting with us here that year and saying, so does a run go by here? And she, it was on Wednesday, <laughs> no, right? She, yeah. she got in Tuesday night. She just won 70.3 Worlds. This was sort of gravy for her. She, yeah. she wasn't coming here to win. She was coming here to scout. And she gets, what, 14, 13, 14 minutes, and she's out there. And now well, you have to have the run of your life to go get this woman who's younger, fast, and is not backing down. Yeah, it was like the next phenom of the sport. Yeah, um, the next Chrissy. I always, uh, people say, well, but you were one of those women. I'm like, no, I was sandwiched between Chrissy and Daniela, like two just phenom, 
phenomenal athletes, like super strong bikers, very good runners. Um, but yeah, she was the next wave. And yeah, I got off that bike and I had a long way. It's been well documented, obviously, but um, yeah, I was a long way off the win and felt like I was, you know, failing because I was the defending champ. 14.30, eighth place off the bike. Like, what, am, what the heck? Like, this is embarrassing. Um, but, but then you caught a few people and all of a sudden you're in a top five and right, right away just getting off the bike in eighth when you know I, I have not had a great one and I'm still in the top ten. Yeah, I think more, I still felt like that was a complete failure, but <laughs> I, I still, I knew that I'd look after myself, I knew that I'd pace the bike well and I'm like maybe they've overbiked and I thought well let's just focus on what I can do. And what I can do is run fast. Yes. And let's see how many girls you can poke, uh, you pick, pick off. And like my first goal was top five. I got actually moved into like from like six to third because three women were running together on the Queen K. So all of a sudden my top five was third. And I'm like, actually, this is a pretty great, you know, defense of my title. Not perfect, but I'm like podium. on the podium. Yep. And then, um, Dan, um, sorry, I think Rachel was next up. Uh, yes. I caught up to Rachel back on the Queen K, and I, I remember patting her on the back and saying, we can't let a rookie beat us. And then I look up the road, and, and you can see well in the distance um, the leader because of the, the motorcade, the, mon the entourage. And so I'm like just zoned in on uh, Daniela and finally caught her in the last you know, few miles before, yeah, before we went up to Polani and... Yeah, the rest is history. Your third and final Ironman World Championship title. But the, those races, when mm -hmm. Mark Allen came back from behind and caught Thomas Hellriegel and Dave Scott ran Mark Allen down, those are the ones that stick out, right? Where you, where you have to dig to the absolute deepest part of yourself. Yeah, I think um, that one gets the most play uh, because mentally, yes, that was my best performance, yes. holding it together and still getting a great performance out of myself when I maybe didn't bike as well as I probably could have. But 2013, I think, was my best performance um, overall. I think, obviously won the race, but I, everything was perfect as it could have been for my fitness on that day. So I look at your run times in 2009, 256, and 2010, 253, 2011, 252, 2013, 250, 38, 2014, 250, 26. What do you think you would have run here with plated shoes? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, and man, I wish I had those shoes. Um, I don't know, you know, like, you know, you talk to all the runners that have done a lot of homework on this, and they say in a, a standalone marathon, you're basically giving up four to six minutes if you don't wear the shoes. Right. And our, our run takes a little longer than theirs, so who knows? I mean, certainly, I would have gotten my 248. Your, your 248 would have been in the bag. Yeah, I think so. I love it. <laughs> and being a mom, three, the third, almost. almost yeah. <laughs> been just balancing that and T.O. coming and T.O. dealing with major heart issue and just it's been an interesting few years for you guys. Yeah certainly um, a lot of a lot has happened in the last sort of five or five years um, from 2019 with the pandemic with Tim's heart attack myself retiring having been pregnant again um, yeah, and we're, we've started a coaching company called Salty Bears, so we're coaching a few athletes now. Um, I retired so I could focus mostly on my kids and have the energy for them, but I love this sport so much and I feel like I can give back, so we started coaching a little bit through TriDot and um, building a community, and, and we're both really loving that, and he's got some other, Tim's got some other projects that he's doing as well, so we're keeping ourselves busy and just, yeah, enjoying being parents to our almost three little ones. Thank you so much for always being so gracious with your time. I love chatting with you. And I still remember back, Craig Alexander, I was interviewing him in Chicago. I forgot what event it was. He says, hey, do you mind if I bring my friend with? Uh, Marinda is going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, right, yeah. uh, one of the first times we met. Yep. And it was like, she is going to love Kona and she's going to be awesome. It's been, it's been a wonderful journey watching you all these years. Yeah, some amazing friendships along the way, yours included, um, Bob. Uh, yeah, and Kona wouldn't be Kona without breakfast with Bob. How about a round of applause for Marinda Carfrey? Hi, Joe Man. And it's breakfast with Bob. And Pacho Man, everybody.